I want to take the opportunity to thank Dr. Wallen, Dr. McWilliams, and Dr. Akhtar for bringing us into their lives and taking us places that are deeply personal, that help us find the places we need to know about and be aware of and seek out as therapists. So thank you so much for that. We couldn't have asked for more. Before you go on. Yes. Is my glasses case on the... Uh, Indeed it is. <laughs> I don't want to lose it. You know, I mean, I already lost it, right? Okay. Okay, our first respondent is Daniel Shaw who's been certified as a psychoanalyst since 2000 after completing the four-year training program at the National Institute for the Psychotherapies in New York City. He's published several papers in contemporary psychoanalysis, including Enter Ghosts, which is becoming part of the secular scripture at the Danielson Institute. Um, he serves on the faculty of the National Institute for the Psychotherapies as a teacher and supervisor of psychoanalytic candidates. Dan coordinated the online colloquia for the International Association of Relational Psychoanalysis and Psychotherapy Group. And before continuing his postgraduate education in psychoanalysis, he was a student of yoga and meditation for more than a decade, living in India for several periods and traveling extensively as an international organizer and manager of yoga education programs. It was out of these experiences that Dan developed his interest in the study of cults and charismatic leaders. Dan currently maintains his psychoanalysis and psychotherapy practices in New York City and Nyack, New York. He's also joined here in Boston uh, by his wife, who we're happy to have here with us. Dan, our first respondent. Thank you. Um, at this conference, I'm also known as Jew number two. Um, I'm really honored to speak here today and especially to discuss David's uh, paper, so open-hearted and so moving. I've, I've greatly admired David's work since I read uh, Attachment and Psychotherapy a few years ago. Spirituality and psychoanalysis were not always and are still not always thought of as compatible. But to me, based on what I think of an experience as spiritual, they're inseparable. You know, it occurs to me to um, mention that um, I had the pleasure of knowing Randy Sorensen, who wrote Minding Spirituality, and who asked me to, uh, if I would review that book. And unfortunately, he passed away um, shortly after uh, our, our uh, relationship was developing, and he was a wonderful um, advocate for psychoanalysis and spirituality. Um, <clears throat> so, I just wanted to put that in. Uh, well, I've been asked to discuss David's paper, and I've also been asked to speak of my own spirituality in re relation to my own work. So given time constraints, what I've chosen to focus on first are some of the similarities in our backgrounds, David's and mine, and the common themes that have influenced us both as psychotherapists. One similarity I recognize immediately is that David and I both bring to our work a desire for and a belief in freedom. Freedom as a human right, freedom for ourselves as therapists in terms of the creativity we're capable of in our efforts to help, and freedom for our patients from the tyranny of trauma and the fragmenting dissociation that is the result of trauma. In terms of how I might differ in my approach from David's, it's a little tricky to get there, and I'm, I may be exaggerating the difference a bit just to make some points. We'll see. Um, as I understand it, the experience David shared with us involved a direct connection to something transcendent, an exquisite, profoundly moving broadening of his perspective, accompanied by an immensity of well-being and gratitude. And since then, he's been able to offer something of this broader perspective to his patients in a way that's deeply meaningful and healing. For me, spirit is imminent. 
and imminent in the human spirit as it can be experienced in the intersubjective intimacy that we call love and as it can potentially be known in the therapeutic relationship. So yes, I'm using the old transcendence imminence debate as a means of speaking to what might be some very subtle differences in our perspectives, but more on that later. First, back to the similarities. Like David, I too was raised in a secular Jewish home, lefty parents, and though the religious aspect of being Jewish was never given importance or emphasis, the ethical and moral values of Judaism, which were conveyed mainly through my parents' cultural and political preferences, they did move and inspire me. And I do have one memory uh, from childhood Passover seders. Uh, while my dad's parents were still alive, we had the traditional Passover dinners with them. And as the story of the Jewish slaves escaping the Egyptian pharaohs is told, we, I think, like many families, we sang the Negro spiritual, go down Moses, let my people go, as part of the ceremony. And my father at this point would sing very loudly, and I realized as I got older that he was trying to imitate Paul Robeson. <laughs> and um, today, whenever I'm invited to a Seder, I, I, um, I open up and sing loudly as well, even though my kids are horribly embarrassed. You know, because freedom from subjugation is a theme I've been drawn to again and again in my life and in my work. David speaks of a developing a masochistic relationship to suffering, a compulsion to assuage the suffering of others, referencing not only his particular family situation, but a culture-wide PTSD for Jews, quote, a centuries-long intergenerational transmission of trauma, unquote. Well, that's exactly right. The shadow of this trauma in my family was my mother's undiagnosed and untreated OCD, which took the form of hoarding. Her problem grew progressively worse as I got older and was the source of endless rages and tears if any of us ever tried to throw anything out. As a child, I was deeply identified with her as the victim of my older sister and my father, and I was her staunch ally, her rescuer. Now this may be the standard template for the male Jewish analyst, I guess. Um, later, I came to a much more conflicted position as I realized how trapped and destructive my mother had become and how much my father had suffered as well. But it wasn't until after both my parents had passed away that I understood the intergenerational trauma more deeply. Well, it was at a Broadway production of Fiddler on the Roof, which I saw in 2004. And I was watching the scene where the Cossacks shoot up Tevye's village, and I suddenly remembered with my five-year-old son sitting next to me, who was wondering why was I crying through the whole show, uh, I suddenly remembered the story my mother had told that when she was three years old, she and her mother had run to a barn in their Ukrainian village because the Cossacks had swept in and were looking for Jews shooting and killing. The cow my grandmother and my mother were hiding behind took the bullet, and my mother and her whole family soon escaped uh, to America. They arrived in New York Harbor on July 4th, 1918, and fireworks were going off as the ship pulled in, and my three-year-old mother, terrified, started to scream, the Cossacks, the Cossacks, in Russian. In retrospect, her hoarding in later life became comprehensible, given how much unspoken, unprocessed loss, grief, terror she and all her family members had known and had always sought to try not to think about. So very much like David, the masochistic streak that I developed early on was linked to Jewish themes of oppression and to my mother's depressive suffering and the sense that I should be able to save her. And I, I do want to give one glaring example of this. Um, I was telling a, a friend when I was in social work um, about seeing the movie 12 Angry Men. I had, I had gone to see it when I was home from college on a break. I'd gone downtown in Manhattan to an art theater that was showing it, and I was coming back on the subway, and I was at the last stop of the D train in the Bronx. And um, early on, a very 
dirty, smelly, drunk guy got on and sat next to me and passed out on me. And, you know, as the train kept getting further out of Manhattan, the crowd kept thinning out, but I sat there and I was determined not to move because I felt that if I got up, he'd fall and crash his head on the hard seat and, you know, I didn't, didn't want him to get hurt. So I told my friend this story, and, and, and really this was based on how moved I had been uh, by the film, which if you have seen it, it's about uh, racial prejudice, and it's about a group of jurors, 12 of them, who finally recognize that they're all deeply prejudiced, and, um, and, and turn around and let the kid go off. So I was so moved, I sat there and I told my friend the story, and she, she had been a therapist for quite a while, and she just looked at me and she said, you were so masochistic. And I thought, wow, that's, that was a revelation. Un, uh, you know, unsolicited analysis, but a good one. <laughs> David's uh, experience, oh no, sorry. Okay, now I wanna get to transcendence, okay. Um, and spirituality. Now, David describes this numinous, transcendent experience of mindfulness as a profound sense of, quote, impersonal awareness, unquote, a variety of spiritual experience that's free of the, quote, dense construct of history, identity, feeling, purpose, unquote. And beyond the capacity for mentalization that David describes as a key to the possibility of finding freedom from the constraints of an internalized past, David recognizes mindfulness as a further possibility for freedom, an experience of knowing and being that transcends the personal and that links all being to the pure consciousness that's, that's the ground from which all individual consciousness springs, at least that's my attempt to talk about that, as I understood you. And um, I think your experience has led to a greater awareness and understanding of your involvement with enactments. And I loved this part of the paper. Uh, David perceives that his Buddhist strand and awakening to mindfulness has blended with his Jewish strand, his identification with suffering, in such a way as to help him recognize when he might be over-identified with suffering, too immersed in the patient's suffering to allow either of them to imagine the possibility of transcendence. And as I hear it, David's mindfulness experience supports both his ability to deeply recognize his patient's suffering and at the same time to take a step back and give his patients a chance to take a step back to recognize something transcendent, something that might help to restore faith in life and evoke compassion for self and others. This awareness David describes seems to have been freeing, emboldening, imbued with healing compassion, and that's exactly what I think psychotherapy can and should do, free, embolden, and ultimately awaken compassion. For many who've grown up knowing depressive suffering, an experience of transcendence or even the idea of it can be deeply appealing. So it's no surprise that by the time I got to high school, Thoreau and Emerson were my idols, although Walden Pond and Concord were pretty far from the Bronx. And um, I wasn't, therefore, entirely unprepared for my first extraordinary spiritual experience, but it, it, it did come as quite a surprise, and I'd like to share that with you. As a struggling actor in New York in my 20s, I struggled a good deal more than I acted. And there were some very low points, the short version, rejection, poverty, loneliness. There was one day of despair when I just started walking out of my little tiny unaffordable apartment and up Riverside Drive, and suddenly I realized I was in front of Riverside Church. Now I'd never really been in a church and it was cold, it was fall, and I decided to go in. And I sat down in the pews and nobody was there, just me, the, um, and the sun was streaming through the stained glass. And um, I, I, this was one of these frozen in time moments. It's, um, what happened was that all at once, um, I was warm, I was 
weeping profusely, and I felt a very firm, strong hand clasp my right hand and heard the words, it's going to be okay. And I did know it was not a real hand and that it wasn't really audible, but it was very real. And um, I sat there for a while like that until I felt the sensation leave me and I looked up and someone, had, someone else had come in the church. So I got up and I was um, pretty amazed and I went home and I started reading the New Testament. And of course I came upon the Gospel of John um, which spoke of the Comforter, whom Marie mentioned earlier, and I knew that I had been visited by the Comforter that day. So, um, of course, I was very tempted at that point to consider becoming a Christian, and I got as far as reading Thomas Merton's book, uh, several of his books. I was listening with rapture to Mahalia Jackson and the Bach cantatas, but over the years, I've read a great, and, and over the years, I've read a, a great many of the writings of the Christian mystics as well. But where I ultimately went in terms of religion was not what I would have expected. And here's what happened: another story. And I promise I will get back to David's paper. So not long after my experience in the church, my luck changed, or so it seemed. I was cast in a show, a very exciting possibility, a workshop with very well-known people, and. I was going to sing and act and dance, and it was um, a, a musical about a Hindu guru, like a Hindu god spell. And, um, you know, I was not into any of this, and I was, I was pretty strongly not into cults, gurus, any of that, and it all seemed very silly. And, of course, the show went nowhere, as did my acting career. So a few years later, at the end of another bout of despair, I learned that that particular guru that we'd been singing and dancing about was in residence upstate at his ashram and that he was giving spiritual initiation. And in fact, a lot of show business people were going to get on a bus and go hear him talk and so on. So this was around 1980. I, I by then uh, sought help from two analysts who were uh, training analysts. One of them said nothing for the first 45 minutes and I didn't want to go back. And the other um, was a little better. She did talk a little bit. Um, she didn't look very interested, though. And I got into a romantic relationship, and she let me know that we didn't need to have therapy anymore. So I ended therapy. The girl broke up with me. The guru was in the ashram, and I decided to go. <laughs> so... So I spent 13 years in the ashram, calling first this man, and then after he died, his female successor, my guru. Now, my, my initial meditation experiences were literally electrifying, indescribably ecstatic, the most intense love and connectedness I, I, I've ever known. And um, being a bit impulsive and <clears throat> borderline or whatever, I quickly sold all my possessions. <laughs> And I took off to follow the guru. Now, for many years, I worked full time for this guru on her world tours and in her ashrams in the US and in India. I meditated and chanted for hours every day. I served in many managerial and teaching positions. I traveled as a teacher, spokesperson. I worked my, my way up closer and closer to the guru because she was the person I believed was God incarnate. And when I left, unfortunately, my wife also left when I did, I was in shock for quite a while because I came to realize more and more fully how deeply and abjectly I had submitted myself to this abusive and very corrupt person. Now, the list of these abuses is extensive. I won't, I won't go into it all, but sadly, if I'm really honest with myself, I knew the truth early on but I didn't want to know that I knew. And most of all, I knew about the cruelty because for months before I moved out of the ashram, I'd been on the receiving end of it from my ex-guru and her appointed surrogates, scathing public criticism and taunting and public shaming and humiliation day in, day out. 
I've actually written more about cults and some of my experiences uh, in a book that's going to be out next year in the Relational Perspective series, which I'm calling Traumatizing Narcissism, and I'm sure you can begin to see why I might call it that. Um, when I finally severed all my ties with the cult, I could feel myself coming out of dissociation, like literally like the blood was coming back into my veins. I would tried so hard to murder my subjectivity and make myself the kind of object the guru would approve of and pay attention to. Because in this kind of relational system, only the leader is perfect. Nobody else is. So to make that clear, the leader has to continually invite you to, to come up, to feel good, to hope, and then to put you down. And that has to happen over and over. Um, Initially, having experienced an indisputably ecstatic mystical experience connected to the guru, I was at my most vulnerable, but it, it, it was a bait and switch. My pre-existing idealism and tendencies toward self-sacrifice and the unhappiness in my personal life at the time made me so susceptible to exploitation, and I chose to follow a leader that led me to idolatry and masochism which are perversions of idealism and self-sacrifice, the opposite of what I would think of as spiritual. So as powerful and as beautiful as my experience in the church was and my initial meditation experience, for me what's been the, oops, that was bad. For me what's been the most meaningful and enduring change that I've known is the experience of finding, claiming, and knowing myself as subject and working out the difference between feeling like a subject and feeling like I need to be the object of someone so that they'll want me and so that I won't be alone. Confused and unconscious about my own traumatic history, searching for a way to feel that I had a self I could feel good about, I ended up drastically objectifying myself in the hopes of being certified as good by my ex-guru in whom I had invested all goodness. I've discovered that many others behave similarly with bosses, colleagues, parents, lovers, siblings. Many who enter psychotherapy know they're depressed or anxious but don't know the extent to which they've forsaken their subjectivity and submitted to objectification as though that would be a way to finally feel good enough. Those many years of submission and accepting abuse from this sadistic guru and thinking it was all for my own good that the cruelty was the form her love had to take to purify me have led me to deeply ponder the nature of being an authority figure, a teacher, and a therapist. Based on my understanding of the trauma of objectification, the trauma of objectification, I want to construct with each patient a way of being in our process so that Neither of us has to feel negated as a condition of being in the relationship. In the psychotherapy context, I view the construction of intersubjective relatedness as necessary for therapeutic change and psychological growth. Now, for those familiar with the intersubjectivity literature, I'm referencing Jessica Benjamin's use of the term in which... Um, um, Intersubjectively constructed relationships reflect what she terms the lawfulness of the moral third. Benjamin speaks here of mutual recognition, which Marie spoke of earlier, the effort we make in relating such that we resist the pull toward becoming a dominator or a submitter, the pull toward falling into a mode of relating where one person has to be the object of the other. Lawfulness in relating means that each person's value as a human being is recognized and respected, and that relating as two separate people, mutually recognizing their shared humanity, is what both emanates from and creates the space of the moral third. In this realm, the experience of being two opens to the thirdness of mutuality, because relating has not been forced into collapse by one negating the other. So to bring this around to David's work, the essential teaching of Buddhism, as I understand it, is that wisdom and compassion for suffering are inseparable and are the goal of being human. 
And I hear that David's experience of a transcendent spiritual wisdom has opened up for him ways of being compassionate that had previously been foreclosed. Identifying with and witnessing suffering are crucial ways of being compassionate, but sometimes compassion will mean helping our patient to recognize a stuckness in their victimization, or perhaps a tendency to negate the alive aspects of himself so as not to lose sight of the parts of himself that have suffered so terribly, as though being alive betrays and abandons the traumatized child in him. Perhaps our compassion can extend to the various parts of this patient, his suffering, of course, but also his aliveness, creativity, resilience, and so on. We're not merely what happened to us, is what I hear David say. Trauma can cause our victimization to be dissociated, but conversely, it can cause our strong, healthy, and vital self-states to be dissociated as well. So, that brings me to transcendence and imminence is the way towards spiritual and psychological health based on a connection to something that transcends the mind and the body, or is that deepest spiritual place imminent within us being expressed as us, as we are fully being ourselves? And I think the real answer to this lies in these words from Matthew, ye shall know them by their fruits. The fruit of David's experience is that he has deepened his empathy and compassion as he's shown us in his work today. The transcendent aspect of consciousness can illuminate a way that we are more than merely our particular selves, our unfree selves. This kind of experience of oneness, of the interconnectedness of all being is deeply healing. But for me and others like myself, the transcendent experience ultimately became a way of feeling separate as I chased my concept of transcendence, I lost myself. The dark side of enlightenment is duality, in which the transcendent is viewed as the only reality, supposedly superior to the mundane, illusory, petty, material world. So getting my feet back on the ground for me has meant working from the imminence side of the dialectic, and I think of it as a dialectic. This is not a dichotomy. As a psychoanalyst and in my personal life, the experience of intersubjective relatedness, a form of relating that's always seeking freedom from the domination and submission agenda that allows us to experience ourselves as subjects in our own right, free of objectification and free of the need to objectify others. This has turned out to be my most valuable spiritual experience. When David speaks of the caregiving, controlling strategy from which he's freed him, freed himself, I know just what he means. From that place, the patient subtly becomes our object, the one we need to be helped so that we ourselves can overcome the feeling of helplessness. Freed of that need to control, David and his patient broke through from impasse to revelation. David and his patient each became free, more alive, more fully and truly themselves, subject to subject. So what David has helped me think about is how I've reconciled within myself the transcendent mystical experiences of my 20s and 30s with the disillusionment of my post-cult life and my subsequent embrace of relational psychoanalysis. Whether through imminence or transcendence, the goal, I think, is the same, the deep recognition of our common humanity, recognition that lifts the burden of shame and fear and the loneliness that are the universal psychic wounds of the human subject. A long time ago, I stopped wondering if I believe in God or not. The intimate subject-to-subject -subject experience in which the human spirit in each of us can be most fully expressed is sublime enough for me. Thank you. Okay, our second respondent, Celia Brickman, PhD, the Director of Education at the Center for Religion and Psychotherapy of Chicago. She also teaches and practices psychotherapy there. She's a native of Montreal, Canada. She spent several years in India as well before coming to Chicago. As a matter of fact, Celia and I uh, exchanged some emails in the process of putting the conference together where she asked if we had intentionally put a group together that would have so many uncanny connections. And uh, I said, we 
you know, even the Danielsons couldn't plan that, so <laughs> we just lucked out. Um, she received her doctorate at the University of Chicago's Divinity School in Religion and the Human Sciences. In addition to aboriginal populations in the mind, she has published many articles and given many talks on topics at the intersection of psychoan psychoan psychoanalysis, race, and religion. We welcome you, Dr. Brickman. Thank you so much for being here with us. So yes, there's going to be quite a bit of overlap um, today. I need my glasses, yes. First of all, um, thank you to the Danielson Institute for inviting me. And thank you, among other things, for introducing me to David's work, which I had not been aware of before and which I have been really delighted to become acquainted with. Um, and I just realized as you were talking that in some of my responses, I'm actually responding to your book as well as to your paper because I read them together and they made a kind of cumulative impact on me. When I first received David's paper, as he just mentioned, I was surprised to find out how similar our backgrounds and interests were. But when I contacted Daniel, uh, uh, Daniel then I was really astonished. <laughs> On this panel, we are, as you now know, we are all three from Jewish backgrounds. We are all three, let me get rid of this. We are all three from, Jew, three from Jewish backgrounds. All three who, one way or another, have found our way to Eastern religious practices. And all three who have ended up writing and practicing within the framework of psychoanalysis. At first, I thought this was quite startling. But on further reflection, I realized that the, we share these similarities because we represent a major development among third generation North American assimilated Jews. And our similarities run parallel to developments in American psychoanalysis. So let me begin by sketching out some of, the, some of our shared history. Towards the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th century, there was a large wave of immigration of Jews from Eastern Europe to North America, fleeing the pogroms and persecutions that were a regularly recurring feature of their life there. Once here, they worked at whatever trade they could. They aimed for assimilation, but they also kept their practice of Judaism. Their children, our parents, negotiated a, meteor a meteoric social rise in a single generation. Born to immigrants with very little in their pockets, our parents attended colleges and universities and became well established in businesses and across the professions. Many in our generation, in our parents' generation, diluted their parents' religious observance significantly becoming less strict in their practices, attending conservative or even reform synagogues that were more accommodating to the changing realities of American life in the mid-century, mid the mid century, or even turning their backs entirely on religious observance. David's family, and now I find out Dan's family and my own, were typical in having retained a modicum of Jewish religious observance, but a strong sense of the cultural, cultural and ethnic identity as Jewish. The hugely traumatic news of the Holocaust shored up our parents' sense of Jewish identity and strengthened their antipathy to racism of any kind because it was as a race that Hitler had wanted to exterminate the Jews. This antipathy to racism led, for example, rabbinic leaders of the Jewish community to march with Martin Luther King but it simultaneously lay in a somewhat uneasy relationship with our parents' upward mobility, which assumed the trappings of white privilege and led them often to social positions that were oppressive to members of African American communities. Although our parents had little belief and even less observance, if they had been asked, as Freud asked himself, what is there left to you that is Jewish they probably would have answered, as Freud himself did, a very great deal, and probably the very essence. 
But as we, their children, grew up, more assimilated into the American mainstream than our parents and steeped in the values of religious and racial tolerance, our Jewish identity became less of a given and more of a question. A similar question was being posed, probably unknown to the three of us at the time, by theologians of the era. Jewish theologians struggling with the meaning of God after Auschwitz and Christian theologians facing the increasing secularism of mainstream culture were declaring that God was dead. Um, we might say that our generation was born in the wake of the death of God, or in the words of theologian Mark Taylor, we were born after God. This loss into which we were born registered on an unconscious level, as can be seen by the fact that not just the three of us, but a significant number of our generation made up a disproportionate percentage of the seekers who found their way into ashrams and meditation centers around the world. Having searched and found, for better and for worse, alternative forms of religiosity, Many of us then felt the need to understand these perspectives in an idiom closer to home and to integrate them with features from the inner landscapes of our backgrounds. For us three, as for many others, it was psychoanalysis that provided the language with which you could do this. And the fact that we turn to psychoanalysis also comes as no surprise, because psychoanalysis too was once a Jewish immigrant to North America. In the 1930s, the rise of Nazism propelled the majority of European psychoanalysts, most of whom were Jewish, to leave their homes and to move to America, some to Britain and some elsewhere. Like the immigrants in our families, psychoanalysis in America was also bent on assimilation. Even before the arrival of psychoanalysis in the States, Freud, like many of our parents' generation, had left behind the religious observance of his upbringing. And it has been persuasively argued that it was the very rupture with the religious past that actually produced the psychological and sociological conditions that allowed for the creation of psychoanalysis. For Freud, as for other European Jewish intellectuals of his generation, secularism and science held out the promise of replacing rate religious and racial divisions with a universal brotherhood of mankind. The analysts who fled Nazism and landed in the United States had, like Freud, for the most part, already left behind the world of strict Jewish observance. The psychoanalysis they espoused, presented as a universal medical science, found a home in many of the departments of psychiatry across the land, and became, for its practitioners, a path to assimilation into one of the more prestigious ranks of white American society. These newly American psychoanalysts developed ego psychology, which posited a conflict-free sphere in the psyche and affirmed the positive role of adaptation to society. These concepts were, in a sense, the theoretical correlates to their drive for assimilation in mainstream America, muting the conflicts that Freud had seen as constitutive of the psyche, while rendering invisible the conflictual social inequalities of race, gender, and social class. There were, of course, important exceptions, like Fromm and Erickson. The constraints of time don't allow me to go into them right now. By the time our generation, the third generation of Jews, descended from that large migration at the turn of the last century, the exclusionary premises of universalism were coming under siege. The civil rights movement, the anti-war and student movements of the 60s, and the women's movement and gay rights movement that followed made evident just what had been repressed in order to create the presumed universalism to which our families and psychoanalysis had aspired. And some decades after these concerns had surfaced in the culture at large, they found their way into the psychoanalytic institutes. One of the major changes that allowed this to happen was the demedicalization of psychoanalysis in 1988. Until, until then, 
and against Freud's express will, the practice of American psychoanalysis had been limited to medical doctors. But once the doors of the analytic institutes were open to psychologists, social workers, and students of the humanities, the newly admitted generation, which included a much larger proportion of women, brought its social concerns with it. The desire for an ever wider equality that was part of the movement of the 60s brought the unassailable authority of the analyst into question. Members of our generation who entered the psychoanalytic institutes questioned why psychoanalysis had characterized women, homosexuals, and African Americans as, psychoanalyt as psychologically inferior and even pathological, and have been reworking the theory to destigmatize these groups and to craft a more encompassing understanding of the psychodynamics of human subjectivity, gender, and interrelationship. The rethinking of all these issues went hand in hand with developments within psychoanalysis that started in the mid 20th century and continue to this day. The development of British object relations, self psychology, and the relational and intersubjective schools of psychoanalysis. To different degrees, these schools all took greater note of the importance of the social context in which the individual psyche developed the ignored or excluded others of psychoanalysis were slowly but surely finding their way into the psychoanalytic framework. And among these excluded others lay the contested terrain of religion. I call it a contested terrain because aside from a clinician, which is how we usually talk about him in these conferences, Freud was a major architect of, of the modern age. And modernity has always defined itself over and against the past, and the religious past in particular. For, therefore, Freud and many of his followers were very explicit about their hostility to religion. Freud intended that psychoanalysis should replace religion. On the other hand, there has also been a century-long conversation between psychoanalysis and religion which stretches from Freud's early uh, co correspondence with his friend, the Protestant pastor, Oscar Pfister, to the taking up of ego psychology by the pastoral counseling movement in the mid 20th century. In a more recent development, what had been a predominantly Christian and Jewish conversation has been joined by a robust discussion between Buddhism and psychoanalysis. So the three of us on this are on this panel in a large part because psychoanalysis shares a cultural ancestry with us. It too was an immigrant to North America, fleeing persecution, persecution and seeking assimilation and quickly gaining success in the United States. It too was born out of the loosening of religious ties on the part of its founders. More recently, it too has developed its own forms of critique of authority and has come to show a greater interest and res respect towards those it had previously excluded, mirroring the concerns of the social movements that we grew up with. And it has been showing a growing concern towards religion, a growing curiosity towards religion, religion mirroring the religious searches that have been typical of our generation. But more than that, psychoanalysis provides a mediating framework for people like David and Dan and myself, who for personal and generational reasons have not been able to live within the strict dictates of our traditional Jewish inheritance. Psychoanalysis represents for us a kind of going home without really going home. It gives us a language that both is and is not Jewish and with which to reckon with our Jewish heritage without becoming completely re-immersed in it. It also gives us a framework within which to work with religious modes of reflection, such as mindfulness, without having to resort to religious orthodoxies. Psychoanalysis does this through its ethos of standing at a critical remove from religion and religious practices, and by analyzing them, within a psychological framework that can, con that can critique and deconstruct, as well as contribute to religious understanding, but through an, e through an ethos that, importantly, brackets or sidesteps 
the ultimate truth claims that religious frameworks entail. David's work has skillfully brought together a number of different bodies of research, attachment theory, neurobiology, relational psychoanalysis, and Buddhist mindfulness technique. Based on this research, he has beautifully mapped the movement from insecure to secure attachment, from avoidance or preoccupation to attuned relationship, from dissociation to mentalization, from mentalization to mindfulness. Building on the work of attachment theorists and the psychoanalyst Peter Fonagy, his model opens up the possibility of a non-authoritarian, non-religious language in which to talk about the enfoldment within psychoanalytic practice of mindfulness. I too have been using breathing, relaxation, and mindfulness techniques in my clinical work for many years. The careful way in which David has theorized the relationships between body, emotions, mentalizing, and mindfulness have been greatly useful to me by placing what I have often done intuitively into a persuasive psychoanalytic framework. His work has clarified several things to me. I'm going to mention two of them. One is the important distinction between the immediacy of experience, which can be said to characterize the embeddedness within a transferential enactment, and the immediacy of experience that characterizes mindfulness. While the, while the immediacy of enactment is unmediated by awareness, the immediacy of mindfulness is itself an awareness that can loosen us from the grip of enactment and open the door to further shared understanding and interpretation. David also admirably clarifies the question of the therapist's self-disclosure, which is often taken as a warrant for the therapist to talk about his or her life experiences that have been evoked by the patient's situation. But I don't know if you would agree with me, but at least for me, your work makes clear that self-disclosure best takes place in the register of mindfulness rather than of mentalization. In other words, Thera therapeutic disclosure is not, as is not so much about how my history may have close similarities with that of my client. What can be usefully disclosed is my discomfort or other, sense of, uh, other state of being that arises within the therapeutic relationship and which may be reflective of feelings or defenses currently felt but unexpressed by my patient. To mention them in a tentative ma manner can open up a conversation about the current state of the transference that may otherwise not be accessible. So now, let me tell you a little bit about how I came to be here. <laughs> I grew up in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, in a Jewish and Anglophone family amidst a largely Catholic and Francophone society. My parents were both second-generation Canadians whose parents had immigrated from Jewish settlements in Eastern Europe. My father, too, had been brought up in an Orthodox home, but had abandoned Orthodoxy as soon as he was old enough to do so. My mother had not been brought up as strictly, and consequently, she was more intent on passing <coughs> on this Jewish inheritance to her children. She lit the Shabbat candles every Friday night and made sure that we celebrated all the holidays in our home. But perhaps one of the differences between my background and David's can be seen in our different understandings of the term Lamed Vovnik. For us, rather than conveying the importance of, su of suffering, the Lamed Vovniks were, or I should say are, 36 people who, in any particular era, justify or redeem the world by the anonymous righteousness of their lives and acts. This kind of anonymous righteousness was a significant theme instilled in us by our parents. In terms of our family dynamics, my parents kept the eatable door locked tight. My mother, who was capable of a more flexible and nuanced understanding of her children than was my father, would not engage in confidential conversation with any of us, lest it risk a conflict between her and my father. My mother, unusual for her time, was a pediatrician 
having overcome the many obstacles women then faced with the choice of such a profession. Her achievements were a great source of pride to my father, but her success made it difficult for her to entertain our childhood and, un and adolescent fears and frailties. Using David's classification from his book, her parenting style was unintentionally dismissive and avoidant. And the response to this style of parenting can be seen in the geographical trajectories of my siblings. Each one has found their way to a different country on a different continent, and each has brought up her children in a different language. Montreal, towards the end of the 1960s, was going through a severe political crisis. Members of the Quebec separatist liberation group kidnapped and murdered a government minister. The army was called out to patrol the streets of Montreal. English speakers were made to feel that they were not welcome, whether or not we spoke French, which I did. In this climate, I entered McGill University at the age of 17 with absolutely no idea of what I wanted to do with my life. So when the English department sponsored a conference on the topic of the meaning of, a, of an English university in a French student, and when each professor mounted the podium to confess that he had no answers to offer, I realized that the very people to whom I was looking for some kind of guidance <clears throat> were themselves quite lost. At that point, I decided to leave school and never to return until and unless I knew what it was that I was returning for. After leaving university, I went to the province of Alberta where I had been promised a summer job. The job fell through, and by chance, a friend turned up who took me on my very first camping trip in the Canadian Rockies. This trip was my revelation in every sense of the word. The magnificence of my surroundings was astonishing to me, excuse me, astonishing to me. And its breathtaking beauty seemed to lift me into a new, previously unknown universe. I didn't formally ask myself the question that David asked himself, who is it who is doing the observing here? But I was suddenly aware of two things that seemed inextricably linked. For the very first time in my life, I was nobody's daughter, nobody's sister, and nobody's student. <clears throat> Stripped of all these relationships and the obligations that they entailed, I was, in a social sense, no one. Yet I was overcome with a sense of great freedom, ease, and happiness. And, and this was quite conscious. I felt to myself that I was now suddenly no one. Freed from being someone, Everything appeared to me to be full of light and sparkling with holiness. I had fallen in love with the mountains and with life itself. I realized that what I might make of my future no longer mattered. I would simply live life day by day, nourished by the holiness of each moment. But after several months of living in this heady state, I, like David, discovered that it was not continuous and everlasting, but rather would come and go. And slowly it turned into a memory. Eventually I came to learn of a little known guru in India who was considered by people I respected to be a master of meditation. He, I thought, would have the answers to the questions that I was now laboring over. How to retrieve that initial world embracing love, how to live a life that was in tune with that love. I followed him to India, where, under his tutelage, I practiced meditation, I listened to lectures given each day about Hindu philosophy, and I learned some, Hindu, some Hindi and became acquainted with the richness of a culture so very different than my own. But this turning to an expert and the community surrounded him, surrounding him proved to have a much darker side. The lectures this guru gave addressed not only the finer points of Hindu philosophy, but came to include harsh public tirades against various of his followers who in one way or another failed to fulfill his standards. Exalted states of consciousness alternated with humiliating vendettas. The guru revealed himself to be a tin pot spiritual dictator who decreed what and how we should think and act. <clears throat> 
He believed that he was the center of the universe, enlightened and immortal, and he needed everyone around him to concede this. I began to realize that all of this, and really so much more, was terribly wrong and destructive, but I had been really seduced by the promise of a spiritual life, and I felt quite caught, unable for some time to figure out how to escape. Once I did find my way out of this community, I was faced with two imperatives. I needed to make a real and satisfying life for myself, and I also really needed to make sense of what I had just gone through in the previous years. How had I, who had grown up in a home that encouraged his daughters to claim their own place in the world, wound up with a guru who dominated everyone in general, and women in particular? How did I come to be in the group of this charismatic yet megalomaniac personality who was bent on destroying any trace of goodness or confidence I might have in myself? I had thought I was seeking spiritual freedom by fleeing a family life embedded in the arid atmosphere of middle-class respectability and professionalism, a life that had not been nourishing my deepest needs. But in that uncanny movement of the repetition compulsion, I wound up in an even more airless and destructive environment. One day in a bookstore in the United States, I found a slim collection of Freud's essays. Standing there in the bookstore, leafing through, I came across a new word, transference. I was thunderstruck. There was a word for what I had just been through. And people thought about this word, and they talked about it, and they discussed it, and they wrote about it. At that moment, I knew that I had to explore these works, and that I had now found the reason I needed to return to university. As I proceeded with my studies and my work, I began to feel that my prior focus on meditation as the road to self-awareness and even transcendence was too narcissistically involved for me. The idea of spirituality itself began to shift its meaning for me from an exceptional transformative state to a kind of shorthand for what calls us to always broaden the horizons of what it can mean to be human and to genuinely encounter and respond to one another. I had also become exquisitely aware of how the often unspoken assumptions of the social situations in which we find ourselves can run counter to the avowed intentions, intentions of the situations themselves. As David and Dan and the relational psychoanalysts argue, the understanding generated in the therapeutic dyad is created by both members of that dyad. But what became clear to me beyond this was that the therapeutic relationship itself is influenced and formed by the theories that guide it. The language of psychoanalysis determines, this, it determines the extent of what can be said as well as what is excluded, what is pathologized as well as what is prized. I began to study Freud's writing on religion at the same time as I was introduced to the works of the early 19th century anthropologists. Suddenly, I realized that Freud had been reading these same early anthropologists and that their disparaging views of savages and other dark-skinned people had found, their ways into, had found their way into his writings. Once again, I found myself in a situation where a potentially emancipatory language was bound up with pernicious views that were at odds with its stated intent. But rather than abandon yet another potential home, this time I was able to reflect upon and write about how the particular language through which psychoanalysis expresses itself unwittingly transmits a worldview shot through with racist attitudes. So I could say that all my formative influences have been mixed blessings. I can neither fully express myself through the unmodified forms in which they were given to me, but neither can I fully function if I abandon them completely. The challenge, as David has charted out so well, is not to enact, but to interact with these inheritances, addressing their shortcomings critically, and yet working with what remains to open up new horizons of value. I'm not sure if I have time how much time do I have? 
Two minutes, okay. I'm gonna skip my little case presentation because I don't have enough time and move right on. To here, there we go. So, David's work demonstrates how what we might call a certain religious stance, perhaps the nunc stans of the church fathers, the everlasting now, is something we can discover and cultivate in our work with our parents as in our daily lives. While this stance may seem to have nothing explicitly to do with God or with religion, it may nonetheless be expressive of a clinician's deepest spiritual outlook. For many people, being religious means believing in something and invites a description of the object of belief. For many, of, for many others, like those of us who are born, so to speak, after God, believing in something does not seem to be possible. But the end of the capacity to believe in a transcendental entity does not mean the, the end of faith. Rather, it may indicate the end of locating faith or holiness in an elsewhere or a beyond, and instead may point us to a way of attuning ourselves in the here and now to encounter a new set of possibilities and new beginnings. I share with David the sense that mindfulness can help, in his words, loosen the grip of the internalized past and the imagined future. David seems to describe his Jewish heritage as part, I might be getting this a bit wrong, but it, it seems that you're trying to describe it as part of the grip you're often trying to loosen. The Judaism are your roots, but Buddhist practice expresses your spirituality. I'd like to end by suggesting that these two traditions may not be quite as far apart from each other as their more widely known practices suggest. And I will end with two quotes from a very recent book of Jewish theology by the wonderful contemporary Jewish theologian, Michael Fishbane. In a language that could easily be David's, Michael Fishbane writes of the need for a spiritual break breakthrough, which he describes as, quote, the spring of beginnings that comes with a reborn mindfulness. And he reminds us that, quote, without the hidden call to attention, we are all but dead in the midst of life. Thank you.